Welcome back. Okay, in the last lecture, we derived from F equals MA, from Newton's second law, the equations of motion of the linear harmonic oscillator, which is just a fancy name for a mass on a spring that is oscillating back and forth. And we presented four different ways of solving uh, for the solution of that position X as a function of time. Okay, so we solved that differential equation. And today, I'm going to uh, add a little bit of complexity to this problem. So we're going to not just study the harmonic oscillator, we're going to add damping. And I'm going to show you, uh, again, how to solve this differential equation by guessing exponential solutions, plugging them into the equation, and getting something called the characteristic equation. So very, very important. This is going to be kind of a, an important bridge to future concepts, uh, so, so pay attention. Good. So the first thing we're going to do here uh, is instead of just having a spring uh, K that's helping us move this mass back and forth, we're also going to add a damper, which is usually drawn something like this. And this damping, we're going to say, has some damping coefficient, uh, let's just call it D, or uh, maybe I'll call it delta later. Um, and so in addition to, uh, to the spring constant, we also have a damping. So as the system is moving at a constant velocity, this damping uh, is going to want to slow down that, that motion. OK, so we're still working with F equals MA. And A is still going to be x double dot. The second derivative of my position is the acceleration from physics. Uh, so x dot is V. V dot is A. So x double dot is A. Uh, and so we can write down pretty simply that our equation of motion is uh, m, our mass, times x double dot. Okay, that is literally just mass times acceleration. And that should equal force. So that equals all of the forces on, on this mass. The first force uh, that we wrote down before is this uh, force due to the spring constant, this restorative force. So that's minus k times x. So literally, if I pull x away from its rest position 0 to some positive position x, the spring constant is um, giving me a negative force in the kind of you know, negative x direction. So the way I've drawn this, uh, positive x is left. So I pull this in the positive direction. My spring is pulling me back in the negative direction. Okay, So that's minus kx. And it's proportional to how hard I pull on this mass. And then this damping term, the way that that works, is similar to this restorative spring force. I have a force that is um, giving me an acceleration, a deceleration, when I have a velocity. So if I have a positive velocity in the positive x direction, this thing is going to try to decelerate me minus d times, uh, times x. And again, it's proportional to my velocity. The faster I'm going, the more this damper is going to decelerate that motion. So pretty simple, uh, we just wrote down F equals MA for, uh, for this problem. And I always like you to think about what my assumptions were. Um, so one assumption I'm making here is that this thing is only moving linearly. So if I actually built a spring and a damper with a mass, this thing would probably be floppy and would not just be a one-dimensional uh, mass unless I put it on rails or something like that. So maybe you can imagine this thing is on rails. Uh, the other thing is this equation doesn't take into account any nonlinear effects. I think any kid who's played around with a, a spring or a slinky has at some point realized that if you pull the spring too hard, then it stops, the force stops being proportional to the displacement. And so sometimes it can increase even more, or sometimes you can actually break the spring, and then, um, and then this is not true. So uh, there are nonlinear effects for the spring constant if you pull this thing uh, hard enough. Okay? Good. Uh, but this is the equation we're going to be working with for now. And of course, we can move all of these terms over to the left-hand side. And so we can say that this equals um, you know, m x double dot plus d x dot plus k x equals 0. And I'm in the habit of ordering my differential equation in terms of the higher, the highest derivative to the lowest derivative. So my x double dots first, then my x dots next, and then my no dots after that. Um, so this is kind of my convention for uh, writing differential equations. You'll see at the end of this lecture why I write it this way. Um, Good, and then I think we're just going to try to solve this differential equation. I'm trying to think if I want to do one more thing. Um, one more thing I want to do is you can kind of divide through by the mass. Uh, and so if you divide through by the mass, then what we're going to do is we're going to get this constant d over m and this constant k over m. And I'm just going to define, um, what do I want to define? I'm going to define uh, d over m equals, I'm going to introduce some variable. I like, um, I like 
Zeta because it's fun to draw. Zeta is a fun uh, letter. I'm kind of a nerd. I, I have a, a you know personal relationship with all of the Greek letters. So D over M is going to be Zeta and K over M we're going to call that omega squared. So again, we know that this thing is oscillating at some frequency, and we're gonna call that frequency omega, and we're going to, you know, from physics, you can show that the square of that frequency is k over m. Uh, so k over m is omega squared, and if I introduce those constants, then I can write this differential equation. I divide by m, and what I get, maybe I'll write this in pink, I get x double dot, plus d over m, which is zeta, plus zeta x dot, plus k over m, which is omega squared, x equals zero. So this is a nice uh, differential equation that I'm going to solve now. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this differential equation using the same technique I showed you in the last video, which is we're essentially going to guess that the solution is e to the lambda t. We're going to plug that in to this equation, and we're going to solve for what lambda has to equal. And we're going to get at this equation called the characteristic equation. After I do that uh, kind of you know, on this, uh, this light board, then I'm going to uh, fire up Python and MATLAB and plot the solutions and show you that, yes, in fact, uh, this solution does make sense. Good. So we just derived this equation, now we're going to solve it. And the way that we solve this thing, um, the, the, the way that I always you know, like to think about this is that we know basically the building blocks of linear differential equations, x dot equals lambda x, are functions e to the lambda t. So we are going to guess, we're going to guess that x of t equals e to the lambda t. This has served us well in the past, even for systems that had sines and cosines as the solution, like the undamped mass on a spring, uh, e to the lambda t was still a good guess because lambda could equal an, an imaginary number, you know, i omega, and that would give me cosines and sines of omega t. So again, from Euler's formula and the Taylor series, you can show that e to the i omega t equals, I'll just write it out, uh, you know, e to the i omega t equals cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. And so even from e to the lambda t's, I can, I can build up cosines and sines and exponential functions. So anyway, long way to say we're going to guess that x of t equals e to the lambda t. We're going to compute its first derivative, its second derivative, and we're going to plug it into this equation. And that's pretty easy. So x dot, the first derivative, is just uh, lambda e to the lambda t. The second derivative, x double dot of t, equals lambda squared e to the lambda t. Okay, so these are our building blocks. And at this point, all we have to do is essentially plug these in to this equation and see what terms you know, have to equal what for this to be true. So we're literally going to write down x double dot, so that's uh, lambda squared e to the lambda t, plus C, no, nope, not C, sorry, is that a zeta? That's a zeta, plus zeta. Remember I said I have these close relationships with all these Greek letters, so zeta um, times x dot is lambda e to the lambda t, plus omega squared e to the lambda t equals zero. Okay, all I did was I guessed a solution, I computed its derivatives, and I plugged it into this differential equation, which we know has to be true because f equals ma is basically always true, okay? And so now I have this expression where every single term has an e to the lambda t. And this is kind of why we like e to the lambda t's, because when we take their derivatives, we get constants times x times e to the lambda t. So every single term here has an e to the lambda t. I can pull that out and I say this is lambda squared plus, um, zeta times lambda plus omega squared, all of that times e to the lambda t equals zero, because every single term has an e to the lambda t, I can pop that out. And this is a recurring theme in differential equations, is that you use the following property. This relationship has to be true for all of time. X is a function of time. X is a function of t, so x of t. And this f equals ma is true at every single instant in time, it's true. And so this expression has to be equal to zero for all time here. So if time is zero, one, two, any fraction of a second, this expression still has to be true. And the only way that can be possible, because e to the lambda t is never equal to zero, except for t equals like, you know, negative infinity, until lambda t equals negative infinity, this thing is never zero. 
So the only way this expression can always be zero is if this polynomial in lambda equals zero. So this implies that lambda squared plus zeta lambda plus omega squared has to equal zero. This is the only way that this differential equation can be satisfied for this function x of t. And this is really, really nice. This is actually exactly what we were looking for, is some equation to constrain what is lambda. Because I just guessed some function x of t equals e to the lambda t. And yes, in fact, I can take its derivatives and I get things that might work in this differential equation. And when I plug them in, I find, lo and behold, that there are, in fact, some lambdas that will work. And those are exactly the lambdas that satisfy this equation. This is called the characteristic equation. Characteristic equation. And this is one of the most important equations uh, in all of linear differential equations. I'm going to write some exclamation marks. This is a big deal because this characteristic equation is what tells me which lambdas are valid solutions uh, for my differential equation. For what lambdas is this a valid solution? And it's exactly the lambdas that satisfy this characteristic equation. Now, I could do this if I had an equation x triple dot, x quadruple dot, any system of equations I had, I could do the same thing. I could guess e to the lambda t, take all of its derivatives, plug them in, and I will get a characteristic equation or a characteristic polynomial with lambda to the same order as my highest derivative. Okay? And I'm going to show you that example in the next few lectures, so, um, so, so we'll do that. Good. Um, so now all we have to do is solve for a lambda, plug it back into this equation, and we're done. We have a solution. So let's do that. Um, you know, in my class, I always ask my students, you know, how many of you remember how to solve this equation? What are the solutions for lambda? And most everybody remembers the quadratic formula, but some people don't, um, and it's an important one. So I'm just going to remind you that the solutions of this equation are um, lambda equals. Okay, so. This zeta is a coefficient, and this omega squared is a coefficient. They're literally just numbers that come from m, k, and d. So if you have a real physical system, uh, you know, zeta and omega are just numbers. So this is a number, and this is a number. And lambda equals um, minus zeta plus or minus the square root of zeta squared minus 4 omega squared, minus 4 omega squared all of that divided by 2. Okay, remember uh, just from your kind of high school algebra class, this is the, um, the quadratic formula that gives you the solutions of this quadratic polynomial in lambda. So we're solving for lambda. This is a polynomial in lambda, quadratic polynomial, second order polynomial, and this is its solution from the quadratic formula. Um, and there are two solutions. There's this, you know, for the plus and the minus of this. And some of these uh, lambdas are going to be real valued depending on some combinations of damping and spraying and mass. So remember from physics, over damped systems don't oscillate. They have so much damping that they just kind of you know, you pull this thing and you let it go and it just immediately goes to zero without swinging or overshooting. So some of these would have real eigenvalues. Some of these are going to have imaginary eigenvalues. If, if 4 omega squared is bigger than zeta squared, this is going to be, the square root of this is going to be, you know, square root of a negative number, that's an imaginary number. And then this thing's going to have oscillatory uh, lambdas. I'll get to all of that in a minute. I'm just, you know, there are going to be different behaviors of this depending on zeta and omega, okay? Those, those two numbers. And um, so there are two solutions. I'm just going to call this lambda comma one comma two. So the lambda one solution, let's say, is the plus solution. The lambda two solution is the minus solution. And so I can write down my final solution of my differential equation as um, x of t equals, and remember because of linear superposition, each of this lam these lambda 1 and lambda 2s are both solutions of my system. So uh, e to the lambda 1t and e to the lambda 2t are both solutions of this differential equation. I could literally take this lambda 1 and this lambda 2 and take e to those lambda t's plug them in, and they're both solutions. And so any linear combination of those is also a solution. That, that's a fundamental property of, of linear differential equations. So constant 1 plus constant 2. And I'm just going to put this in maybe a, a blue box. This is a solution for all C1 and C2. 
Okay, and this is actually kind of a good homework uh, problem for you, is to you know, take this expression for, for the lambda plus and the lambda minus, lambda one and lambda two, and take any linear combination of those, you could even just write down some generic C1 and C2, just some constants, and now take this expression and plug it into your differential equation. Take the first derivative of x, take the second derivative of x, you know, written like this, plug it into your differential equation, and convince yourself that yes, in fact, because each of these were independently solutions, now when I add them up, it also still solves, satisfies this equation. Okay, that, that's a really good exercise to convince yourself that if I have multiple solutions for a linear differential equation, then I can add any combination of those solutions, e to the lambda 1t and e to the lambda 2t, and that's still a solution. Good. Now, uh, how would you find what c1 and c2 are? C1 and C2 would be uh, uniquely determined by my initial conditions. So if I had initial conditions for this problem, then there would only be a, a single C1 and C2 that would satisfy those initial conditions. So for example, if I have, let's say, um, you know, x0 equals x0 and x dot at time 0 equals v0, then I can say, okay, x at time 0 is just e to the 0 is 1, e to the 0 is 1. So x0 is just c1 plus c2. And similarly, I could take the derivative of this and I would get uh, x dot is you know, c1 lambda 1, e to the lambda 1t plus c2 lambda 2, e to the lambda 2t. And if I plug in 0, I get x dot 0 equals c1 lambda 1 plus c2 lambda 2. And so that equals v naught. This is c1 lambda 1 plus c2 lambda 2. And I would basically use this system of equations to solve for c1 and c2. Okay, so I have two equations with two unknowns, c1 and c2. I, I, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are numbers that I have calculated here. Here, x0 and v0 are numbers that were given to me as the initial conditions of the problem, and so I can solve for c1 and c2 that uniquely satisfy these initial conditions. Okay, so with initial conditions, I can solve exactly for what these c1 and c2 are. Good, uh, what else do I wanna show you? This is how you solve second order differential equations in general. So now you can see that this kind of had arbitrary coefficients, um, you know, by changing the mass, the damping, and the spring constant, I get kind of all possible second order linear systems here. Um, and by dividing through by mass, you can see that really it's, there's only two parameters that matter. And by guessing a solution, plugging it in, you get this very, very important characteristic equation. This is kind of the most important bit. And then because of linear superposition, this is going to have two solutions, two lambdas that work. And so I'm going to get two solutions to this equation and any, or any linear combination of those two solutions works. Uh, and again, you can solve for those coefficients by the initial data, by the initial conditions x0 and v0 for the problem. Good, okay, so now I'm actually ready to fire up some Python and MATLAB and just show you, you know, we're gonna simulate this. Uh, I'm just gonna plot some of the solutions and, and that's, gonna be, uh, that's gonna be the lecture. Maybe the last thing I'm gonna show you, because uh, I think this is pretty important, is um, I can take this equation here. And again, in the last lecture, I alluded to the fact that we can suspend variables. We can introduce a new variable, uh, x and v. So x dot equals v. And v dot is, of course, a, my acceleration. And my acceleration a equals minus all this stuff. So this equals minus omega squared x minus zeta x dot. And x dot is v, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to say minus zeta v. And we can write this as a matrix system of equations. So when I do this in MATLAB, I'm literally going to write this as a matrix system of equations, DDT of x and v equals, and then there's going to be a matrix times x and v, where now DDT of x is here. You can literally, the way I think about this is, you know, this vector times this matrix does, you know, you kind of knock it over on its side and multiply. So it's 0 times x plus 1 times v. So x dot equals v, correct? And similarly, the second row, v dot equals minus omega squared times x minus zeta times v. So I can equally well write this as, um, 
this linear system where this is now a two by two A matrix. And what I'm gonna show you in future lectures, I think in the next lecture and in the next probably three or four lectures, is that the eigenvalue equation for this A matrix is exactly the characteristic equation for, for this system. So the eigenvalues of A are exactly the lambdas that satisfy this characteristic equation. Very important property. Um, so eigs of A, let's call those lambdas, satisfy the characteristic equation. That's a big deal, really, really big deal, because these are equivalent systems. Like I can, you know, this differential equation and this differential equation are identical, and the eigenvalues of this are going to be the characteristic equation of this. Um, okay, good, so I think I'm ready to um, do some MATLAB. I really boxed myself into a, a nice little corner here. This feels cozy. Uh, let's hope that this is enough space for me, and I am going to go here and try not to knock my computer over. Good, um, so let me just erase Euler's formula. It pains me to do it, but I'm gonna erase Euler's formula. You should remember it by now. Uh, if someone you know, wakes you up in the middle of the night and you know, at gunpoint and asks you what is Euler's formula, you're gonna say e to the i t equals cosine t plus i sine t. Okay, and if, they, if you don't remember and they ask you to prove it, write down the Taylor series for e and plug in i t and show that you get all of the terms, you know, uh, that are real form a cosine expansion and all of the terms that have an imaginary coefficient form the sine expansion, okay? That's Euler's formula. Good, I really can't get this uh, to be where I want it to be. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is literally, um, you know, just code up this um, in, in MATLAB and then also code it up in Python so you can check the chapters where you want, uh, if you want MATLAB or Python. And we're just gonna play around with these solutions. So, um, you know, you can download this code. This is nothing kind of fancy happening here. Um, and what we're going to do is, of course, I'm gonna close all and clear all. I always do that in MATLAB. And then um, I'm setting up my, my natural frequency and my damping ratio. I'm just picking two numbers for omega and for, um, I think here I got lazy and I, instead of calling it zeta, I'm just calling it D. So in my MATLAB code, D is zeta. So I hope you can bear with me. It's not this, it's literally, Z is that zeta? No, it's D, yeah, it's D, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm being a little glib here. It is actually the damping the damping ratio. Let let let's let's just try it out. Okay, so there's just some numbers. It doesn't really matter. I'm picking some numbers for omega and for zeta, or if you like, for mass time and 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 spring constant and damping d, and I'm going to solve this in the same way uh, by using this A matrix. So you'll notice that this A matrix here is exactly what I've written down here, where now this zeta is minus two d times w. Um, minus two D times W. I think you'll have to convince yourself that this is the same as zeta. Um, I can't quite figure out why that's true right off the top of my head, but I think you can, uh, you can convince yourself that that's true. Okay, good. Um, and what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to simulate this, I'm gonna start by simulating this using kind of the most naive uh, way possible, which I think you're gonna kind of like actually. So um, whenever I think about this, I really am uh, kind of in a corner here. So w the way I like to think about this is the following. If I have DDT of some X, if I've got some DDT of X, equal some a times x, then what I can do is instead of computing this exact derivative with the limit as delta t goes to zero, I can approximate this using a finite delta t. And so I'll say, okay, well the delta x is approximately equal to a x delta t. And this gives me an update rule to step x forward by this little delta x. Every delta t, every time step, every time, little time forward, I pick a small delta t, I can step my x forward by a delta x. And so this basically gives me an integration rule, and it says I can update x, every delta x, according to this formula, every delta t in time. And so that means I can set up a, a essentially a difference equation, x at time k plus one, equals my last x plus this little delta x, plus, you know, a x k delta t. And so now uh, this index k here 
specifies what my time step is if I'm on the first time step, the second time step, the third time step, and each time step is k times delta t. So time k is just k delta t, and this is an update rule for my differential equation. So I'm actually going to code this uh, differential equation update up, and that's what we're going to simulate to begin with. So this is called the forward Euler uh, integration. So again, uh, anything with Euler's name is a pretty big deal. This is kind of the easiest, simplest, first thing you could think of to integrate um, a differential equation is this forward Euler update. I'll, I'll derive this again. I'm going to have like a whole three lectures on, you know, when this is a good idea, when this is a bad idea, deriving this from scratch. I'm just kind of writing it down quick and dirty, so we'll, we'll get into this a lot more later. And then we're also going to use some built-in techniques in MATLAB called ODE45, which is a much more accurate way to integrate. Okay, so the first thing is we set up a dt, a little time step, that's this delta t here. We also set up this big t, which is how long in time we want to integrate. Um, so we're going to take as many steps k as little dt's fit into big t. So it looks like a thousand steps. I'm going to take a thousand steps. And I need some initial data Data. x naught equals 2 semicolon 0. That literally means um, my initial condition, I'm defining here um, x is a vector that contains my position little x and little v, and my, my velocity, my position little x and my velocity little v. And so my initial condition x naught is really uh, you know, my initial position and my initial velocity stacked up into a vector. Okay, so my initial position is 2 and my initial velocity is 0, which means I pull this thing to a displacement of 2 units and I let it go with no velocity. That's the initial condition x naught. And to iterate this thing forward in time, I'm literally doing exactly what I wrote down here in blue. So, you know, for k, as many little dt's fit into big T, that's going to be about 1,000. Uh, we're saying, well, my time is k times delta t, that's what I wrote down here, and my x k plus 1, my, my x at k plus 1 is equal to, okay, identity times x, that's just x k, plus delta t times a times x k. This is just, I don't know why I wrote it this way, but this is just a times x k times delta t, okay? And identity times x k is just x k. Uh, okay, and so we can plot that, and then similarly, I'm going to use this built-in ODE45 MATLAB integrator, which is a fourth-order Runge-Kutta scheme. Again, I'm going to have a whole lecture on Runge-Kutta integrators and why it's good, but for now, you can just uh, take for granted that I'm using a really good built-in integrator. I'll show you how to use this and what this means and, you know, what the notation is of at t comma x a times x. This is creating a little function on the fly for d d t of x equals a times x. That's what this notation is doing. And I'm going to plot both of those solutions. And let's hope it runs. It's busy, it's running, nice, okay? And I'm gonna set my GCA font size to 24, because I think that'll look nicer. Okay, so here, I'll do that for both plots in a minute. And I will show you what we are looking at. Okay, so um, what we have here in these two plots, let me bring this up. The first plot here is literally just plotting my position, x of t, as a function of time. And I'm plotting these two curves, my forward Euler and my ODE45 integration. And so you can see that they have the same basic behavior that my position, you know, it starts at two units, so it starts at time zero at two, that's good. And then as you expect, it's kind of oscillating back and forth and eventually damping out because this damping is going to kill that oscillation. And so this thing is oscillating and dying at the same time. So if I computed lambda, I'm guessing this would have a negative real part plus or minus uh, an imaginary part. And that means that I'm going to get this damped exponential envelope with oscillations uh, in the middle. And again, I'm gonna derive all of that and show you why that's true. We're gonna look at what all of the combinations of what can happen for all of these eigenvalues. We're gonna look at that in the next few lectures. I'm just showing you that this kind of matches our intuition that this thing is gonna oscillate and then die out. Okay, and there's a little difference between these two curves because forward Euler is not very accurate. This was a really cheesy approximation, uh, and the ODE45 is actually very accurate. 
And similarly, in the bottom plot, what I'm plotting is, I believe, position versus velocity, x versus x dot, or x versus v. And again, in that plane, you can see this is called the phase plane, or a phase portrait. You can see that this system is spiraling towards a fixed point with position 0 and velocity 0. Eventually, it's going to come to rest at this point here. And in phase space, this is what the dynamics look like. Um, I think it's also fun to change um, my delta t, let's see what happens if I make delta t uh, a lot smaller. Okay, so if I make it a lot smaller, I'm assuming my forward Euler and my Runge cutter are going to get closer together because this is going to get more accurate, I hope. Let's see. Whoops. Uh, okay. It's going to take a little bit of time. And now you can see these two curves are almost perfectly on top of each other. There's almost no difference. If I zoomed in, you could see it. So decreasing the delta t makes this a more accurate scheme. Uh, presumably increasing delta t is going to make it way less accurate. In fact, at some point, it might even become unstable. Whoop, it became unstable. Uh, you can see that it, my, my integration actually became unstable because it was so bad. This big delta t had so much error, it went unstable. So I need at least uh, 0.01 for something to look reasonable. Okay, good. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, we derived this differential equation from scratch. We solved it uh, using the standard techniques, and we can plot it in MATLAB or Python. I probably am not going to walk through all of this Python code. It is like almost identical. Um, this is written, written by Alan Kaptanoglu, um, and it's, it's basically the same exact ingredient. So you set up omega and d, you build this A matrix, you can integrate with forward Euler, you can integrate with the built-in runge cutta scheme uh, using um, this kind of uh, solve IV P initial value problem, and it's kind of the same thing. Maybe one thing I will show you is what happens if I change the damping ratio. So if I change the damping ratio, it changes these eigenvalues, these lambdas. And uh, in fact, so if I make this thing like, let's say instead of 0.25, I make it 2.5. So I make it 10 times bigger damping. What does that do? Okay. So now my system is what's called critically damped. And you can see that it has no oscillation. It goes to rest. It basically goes from, from my displacement immediately to rest. And it doesn't overshoot or oscillate because it's critically damped. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit based on these eigenvalues. Um, but by changing this damping ratio, you can make it uh, more or less damped. If I make it almost not damped at all, so I get rid of almost all of the damping, I'm assuming this thing's going to oscillate a lot more. And it's not going to converge as fast. That would make sense to me. It's taking a really long time to run now. Um, maybe I'm freezing up my computer. Let's see if it actually runs. It shouldn't be taking this long. I'm asking a lot of my computer today. There you go. And you can see uh, at least the blue curve is the accurate one. This is the, the Runge Kutta scheme. The blue one is eventually decaying, but very, very slowly. Okay. And it looks like my forward Euler scheme, my kind of crappy integrator here, is not doing a very good job. Okay, that's all I want to show you. Um, so next time we're going to do some more examples of second order systems. We're going to, you know, derive another system like this, go through the same math, solve for the initial, you know, with the initial data for the constants, um, just to get your intuition. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to higher order equations with triple dots and quadruple dots. And we're going to look at how when you write them as systems of equations, the eigenvalues in the characteristic equation mean the same thing. So that's all coming up. Stay tuned.